ago. Over the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about the resurrection. And this is something that obviously came up around Easter time. Um, you know, as I was preparing for a Good Friday service and then preparing for, you know, a Sunday service. And as I started to kind of get into more around the, the resurrection of, of Jesus and what that meant for us and what that continues to mean for us, I just... I felt like a real burden for it, and I felt a real burden for us that we need to really understand what this whole thing means. We need to really understand what this, this kind of this, this resurrection represents for us today and then even moving forward. And it's, there's something that I learned through researching this and studying this that was like at first a little bit controversial to me. I thought, can this be right? Can, it, can this actually be like a real thing? And it's this quote here, and it, it says, the Bible... The Bible is the authority that we live under, but the resurrection is the foundation of our faith. So the Bible is the authority we live under, but the resurrection is the foundation of our faith. So the difference there between an authority that we live under and then the foundation of our faith, is, it's two separate things. But I want you to understand that, that our faith does not come from the Bible. For, for many of you, it may because someone opened the Bible and taught you the Bible and you learned about Jesus or you gave your life to Jesus because of something like that. But the Bible represents for us, it's, this, it's a, an authority that we live under. It's God's Word. It's God's living, breathing, real Word. It is the Word of life. It is the Word of truth. It is, it is the authority in our lives. There is no greater authority in us than the Bible. But the Bible's not our foundation. See, the Bible wasn't around when Jesus was around. You, you had things that were a part of what we would then collect later to become the Old Testament. But the Bible wasn't there. And so the Bible can't be our, our foundation. It's the resurrection. See, the resurrection is, is so important that without the resurrection, all Jesus was was a, a rabbi. He was a clever rabbi that could recruit people to follow him and could recruit people to, to do what he said. And maybe he even got lucky a couple times and he performed some miracles or some things just fell into place magically and some amazing things happened and people attributed those miracles to Jesus. But that would have been all that Jesus was if it was not for the resurrection. If it wasn't for the resurrection, all Jesus would have been is another Jew crucified or put to death by the Romans. See, the resurrection is so important that even when Jesus died, everything in his ministry died with him. It, the, the disciples watched Jesus hang on the cross, and when Jesus died, they went and they hid. Because in their minds, the last three years of Jesus' teaching is now it's done. It's over. Because this guy is just, he's dead and he's gone. And so they went and hid. Peter denied him three times, and he went and hid. And the disciples, yeah, they, they, they hid under a rock because it was done. No one expected the resurrection. Jesus was embalmed. He was buried in a tomb. Mary even went back to make sure he was embalmed correctly. No one expected the resurrection. It is because of the resurrection that, Jesus is, that everything that Jesus said and everything he stood for is accepted by us and accepted by his disciples as the true Son of God. See, it was when Jesus appeared to the disciples that they said, Oh man, this thing is real. This thing that this guy's been teaching us for the last three years and, and been teaching us over the last couple of months, this thing where he would tear his body down and then rebuild it in three days, this is what this means. This is real. I can't imagine the relief that they felt when everything that they stood for died on the cross and they thought it was over and done. And then all of a sudden, it came back and they were like, whoa, this thing is absolutely real. And see, the resurrection for us, it also represents something really important that we're going to talk about today. And the resurrection is the moment in time where the old covenant shifts to a new covenant. Now, what I mean by covenant, covenant is a word that we don't really say often. It's a word that um, it doesn't come up in, in our language or in my daily conversation with my wife. Uh, we don't wake up in the morning and talk about the covenant that we have with each other or go to bed at night speaking about how did you do on your end of the covenant. But what the covenant is, is think of a covenant as like an, agree, an agreement of terms in order to define a relationship. 
It's, it's if I have a covenant with Casey, my wife, we have agreed upon some terms that define that relationship. If I keep my end and she keeps her end, and we do the things that we said we would do on the altar when we gave each other, um, when we gave ourselves over in marriage, then that is a covenant that we have together. And so when Jesus resurrects, Something amazing happens, and if you read about it in the Bible, when Jesus died, you had this, this curtain that tore. I don't know if, if everyone knows that story, but when Jesus took his last breath, there was a curtain in the temple, and this curtain actually separated the people who, who could come to God, the priests, and then everybody else. And that curtain, when Jesus died, it tore. And when it tore, it began the process of getting rid of the old covenant and shifting to the new covenant. So that means that the old way, and this is important for us to understand, the old way that we define our relationship with God is going to change. And now there's a new way that defines our relationship with God and defines God's relationship with us. So that's what we mean by an old covenant and a new covenant. Now, the best way to explain this to you is if you look at your Bibles, there's, there are two covenants in your Bible. There's an old and there's a new so you could look at the Old Testament, that's your Old Covenant, and you could look at your New Testament, and that's your New Covenant. So you have the front half of the Bible, the back half of the Bible. And the Old, Cove- or the Old Testament, where it gets its covenant from, is it, it gets it from a, a, a time when Moses went up on the mountain, and Moses was given the Ten Commandments. Okay? So Moses is a guy that frees the Israelites, and he leads them towards the promised land, and they're moseying on their way to do that. Moses goes up on a mountain, and God gives Moses Ten Commandments. And then on his way down, he gets mad. He sees the people, they're living in sin and doing partying like crazy. He gets mad, he breaks the tablet. He's got to go back up on top of the mountain and get the Ten Commandments again. And then he comes down, and those Ten Commandments would then shape the covenant between the Israelites and Jesus, or, and God. So those were ten rules that governed their relationship between God and their relationship with with themselves. Now, in the New Testament, you don't have those ten commandments. Instead, you have one commandment. So Jesus sums up the New Covenant in the New Testament with one verse. He's asked, Jesus, what is the most important commandment to keep? Now, this is a really interesting question that Jesus has asked. They're trying to call him out. They're trying to trick him. And the reason that they're trying to trick him is they know that not only are there these these Ten Commandments, but there's actually a whole bunch of laws and rules that are put in place to protect the Ten Commandments. Because in the Old Testament, the covenant was so important, it was so valuable, that they were afraid to even begin to break one of the Ten Commandments. And so when Jesus is asked, Jesus, what is the most important commandment? Jesus, he sums it all up in one commandment, and he says, the most important thing is to love God with all your heart and to love your neighbor. So Jesus sums it into one. Now, I think this is kind of uh, an interesting thing. Let me just put it in perspective for you. You have 613 laws in the Old Covenant. 613. It started with 10. And then man got involved and created 613 additional laws to protect us, to protect them so that they don't break one of the Ten Commandments. And then Jesus, in the New Testament, under the one covenant, under the new covenant, he gives us one command. Love God, love your neighbors. I, I like this one better than I like the 613. But I think, I think this is an important number to look at because it, it signifies so much. See, this, this 613 laws, this comes at the end of an enormous effort by the Jewish people to preserve what God had given them. This is 613 laws of of dedication, of passion, of, of them really, really, really wanting to honor their relationship with God. I don't think that there were any bad intentions when they created 613 laws to protect themselves. But somewhere along the way, that got out of line. And then it became all about the law, more than it was about the covenant with God or anything else. And so then when Jesus comes, he highlights, hey, there's only one of these. So I've got a perfect story for you in John chapter 8. And this, this signifies, this represents 
the perfect tension between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. I, 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 I couldn't imagine a better story, a better uh, recollection of an event that would show you what happens when the Old Covenant comes up against the New Covenant. And so we're going to turn here in John chapter 8. I'm going to read this to you guys and highlight a few things along the way. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives early in the morning. He came back into the temple court, and all the people were coming to him. He sat down and began teaching them. So, like I said, Jesus was a rabbi. A rabbi is known as a teacher. So without the resurrection, all Jesus is is just a rabbi. That's where that statement comes from, because he was literally seen as a teacher who had followers, a rabbi. So he walks into the temple, and people sit around him, and he's going to... He's going to be teaching them. So now the scribes and the Pharisees, now the scribes and the Pharisees, the Pharisees were the people that could keep the law to perfection. They knew the law better than anyone else knew the law. They had all 613 rules uh, memorized. They had the Old Testament memorized. They knew everything. And the scribes were in charge of making sure that the Old Testament, or what we call the Old Testament, were copied with accuracy. They were the ones that, that had access to the text. They were the ones that that were writing this stuff down. So here you have the people that were perfect at writing and following all 613 laws. They knew this old covenant better than anybody else could have known the old covenant. So they think they're slick. So the story goes on. Now the scribes and Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. So she was... You can use your imagination there. They made her stand in the center of the court, and they said to him, So, teacher, this woman has been caught in the very act of adultery. So this woman is brought in in the center of the temple court. I mean, that that is, there's hundreds of people around. This is a big place. There's a lot of people there. And when the scribes and Pharisees bring somebody in, it gets attention. So I want you to imagine there being a a, a large number of people gathered around. And the scribes and Pharisees bring this this woman to Jesus, and she stands there, and she's made to stand there. And they they use her as a tool to try and trick Jesus. They use her as a tool to try and, and, and mess up Jesus or get Jesus to trip up on his words. But in the meantime, this woman is standing there, and guess what she knows? She knows she's dead. She knows that she's dead. And see, the Pharisees, they go on to explain why she knows that he's dead. In verse 5, Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women to death. So they weren't going to stone her because they were bad people. They were going to stone her because she deserved to be stoned. They were going to stone her because by law, by Moses' law, Moses, the holy God that encountered God uh, at, at the burning bush, Moses, the guy that, that led the Israelites out from underneath Pharaoh's control, Moses, the guy that, that saw God pass before him and didn't die, Moses, that Moses, commanded that this woman, for getting caught in adultery, should be put to death, should be stoned. So here's this poor woman, caught in adultery, standing there. She knows she's dead. And the Pharisees and the scribes look at Jesus And they say, the law tells us that this is a dead woman. And so Jesus, he gets an opportunity. They actually say to him, so what do you say to do with her? What is your sentence? They said this to test him, hoping that they would have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus, he did something very peculiar. Jesus stooped down and began writing on the ground with his finger. However, when they persisted in questioning him, he straightened up and said, and this is so, so beautiful. He says, He who is without any sin among you, let him be the first to throw the stone, the stone at her. See, Jesus understood that the old covenant meant that the scribes and the Pharisees were fine and that this woman should be put to death. That's the old covenant. But Jesus knew that the new covenant was one of life. And Jesus knew that based on his new covenant, that a sinner was a sinner. That it didn't matter if you were caught in adultery, or it didn't matter if you were were prideful or greedy or whatever it was. 
So Jesus looks at the scribes and Pharisees while he's doodling around in the dirt. And there's a lot of speculation on what he was doing there. Maybe he was just thinking. But he looks at them and he says, hey, okay, i tell you what. You can, you can stone her, sure. But make sure that you don't have any sin in your life and any sin in your heart. And those guys could not do it because they knew that they were just as bad as this woman was. And so, one by one, the, they begin to go out one by one, starting with the oldest ones, probably because they were the wisest, uh, and probably because they'd lived the longest, so they knew they'd done the most wrong. But until he was left alone with this woman. So now Jesus is standing there alone with this woman, and she's standing before him in the center court. Jesus, he's straightening up. Jesus says to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She answered, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go from now on and sin no more. See, right there, Jesus introduces a new covenant. See, this woman had 613 reasons why she should be dead. The scribes and Pharisees had 613 reasons why she should be put to death. And they were justified. But Jesus, he only needed one reason that this woman should not be put to death. And that was the love that he had, the forgiveness that he had, the grace that he had. See, the old covenant said to stone her. The new covenant said to set her free. And by this example, Jesus also shows us that, that this new covenant, that, that his way, this way that he's releasing to people and trying to teach people of, means that no one gets the opportunity to judge anyone. Because the, the scribes and the Pharisees were the ones that had the most opportunity to judge everyone. In fact, that was their job. And we're going to learn about Paul doing that professionally uh, as this message goes on. But they were given the job to do this. And Jesus is saying, even you who have the job to judge others based on the law cannot do this. Because you're all sinners. There is no condemnation. So I, I think we carry so much condemnation in our life. We carry it. We, we condemn ourselves, we condemn others, and I think it's so special and so important that Jesus says to this woman, did no one condemn you? She says, no one, and he says, I do not condemn you either. Now go on and sin no more. Right there you see the, the perfect example of what happens when the old covenant comes smashing into the new covenant. You have a group of people quoting the Old Covenant, and you have Jesus and His love representing the New Covenant. So the question that I would ask for you before we go on any further today is, which covenant do you live under? See, if you find yourself asking questions like, why am I not a worthy dad? Why am I not a worthy mom? Why am I not a worthy son or daughter? Well, you know what? You're living under the Old Covenant. If you say, why can I not kick this bad habit? Why can I not stop drinking? Why can I not stop looking at pornography? Why can I not stop being so prideful or so conceited or full of myself? I wish that I could quit these things, but I just can't quit these things. What's wrong with me? I'm flawed. There's something majorly wrong with me. If that's you, then there's a part of you that's living under the old covenant. See, when we live under the new covenant, we start changing the way that we think about ourselves. We start to think about ourselves under a different light. We start to say things to ourselves like, hey, you know what? I forgive myself. I forgive myself for what I did wrong today, but I know that I'm forgiven by God, so I forgive myself. You know, I'm not going to hold a grudge against my neighbor, or I'm not going to hold a grudge against my coworker. I'm not going to hold a grudge against that person that has done me wrong a million different ways, a million different times. I'm not going to hold a grudge because I live under the new covenant. Because see, when you carry around the old covenant, so if we take holding a grudge, for example, when you hold grudges against people, that wears you out. That can actually shorten your lifespan. Stress wears you out. And Jesus not only is trying to free you from that, but he's trying to give you life. And so what I want you to ask yourself through the rest of this message is, which covenant do you live under? Do you live under 613 reasons why you should be condemned? Or do you have 613 reasons why somebody else should be condemned? Or do you have one reason why you're loved by Jesus and one reason why you can love everyone else in Jesus' name? See, I'd rather live under the one 
than live under the 613. And so as we look and as we open up more of the scripture, Jesus does this amazing thing. See, we have to get this covenant thing right. And we have to get this resurrection thing right. See, the resurrection is what brings on the new covenant. Now, we have two examples in the Bible, two more examples. We have a guy named Paul, and then later we're going to get to a guy named Peter. And Paul, who was originally known as as Saul of Tarsus, what, what Saul was, and Paul is his Roman name, but what Saul was is Saul was the guy that went out and persecuted Christians, which they weren't called Christians at the time. They were called followers of the way. And so these people that followed Jesus and his teachings that believed in the resurrection, they were represented by this thing, this movement called the way, and it would threaten Jewish culture. And so Paul was like the best Pharisee that there was. Paul was the best at keeping the law. He knew it better than anybody else. And Paul goes to the high priest and he asked the high priest of the temple, can I have your permission? Can I have your blessing? Can you write a letter for me giving me permission to go out and actually find all the people that are following the way and persecute them. And they, they give him permission to do that. So Paul famously, he begins his trip and he's going north. And he goes on the road to a place called Damascus. And he's going to persecute and to kill and murder Christians. Even the women, even the babies. Because Paul wants to eradicate this movement completely. And so while Paul is on the journey, while he's on the road, this amazing thing happens and there's this flash of bright light and Paul is put to, uh, Paul is blinded and he can no longer see. And he has this encounter with Jesus on that road and he loses his sight and he goes into Damascus and while he's in Damascus, this, this other amazing thing happens where, where God actually calls this man named Ananias. And Ananias comes to, uh, comes to Paul and says, Paul, I'm supposed to heal you, and he heals Paul from being blind. Now, Ananias was very afraid to do this, as he should have been, because Paul had a reputation for killing people. And so God tells Ananias, hey, I want you to go find this Paul guy, and I want you to heal him. And Ananias is probably like, yeah, but you know he's coming to kill all of us. And God says to Ananias, he says, he is my chosen laborer. He is the one that I've chosen to do my work for the church. And so Ananias heals him. Paul opens his eyes. And when Paul opens his eyes, he sees very clearly the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. He can't see it any other way. And in fact, there's a, this, this amazing thing that, that unfolds later in Paul's ministry. See, let's remember, Paul went from becoming someone that was sent out to kill Christians He was sent out to eradicate them, which means that Paul was sent out to be the ultimate judge for people. Paul had 613 reasons to judge and murder and stone Christians. That's where Paul started. After Paul had an encounter with Jesus, look at what happens with Paul. So we're going to turn to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians... uh, Let's see here, 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11. So Paul says, Paul's writing a letter to the church in Corinth. Now this is after Paul's conversion, okay? So keep in your mind, Paul, the Christian slaughterer, uh, the guy that was going to be the ultimate judge of people. And judge is an important word there. And in, in verse 9, Paul writes, I wrote to you in my previous letter, not to associate with sexually immoral people, not meaning the immoral people of this world or the greedy ones and swindlers or idolaters, for then you would have to get out of the world and human society altogether. You know what's interesting there is Paul, he's written the church a letter before, and Paul is reminding them, I didn't tell you to stop hanging out with with people outside the church. Because if you stop hanging out with people that sin, if you stop hanging out with idolaters, if if you stop hanging out with people that are doing something that doesn't you know, align with, with this way that you're following, well, then you can't even live in society. You, you can't even live with the world. So Paul is saying, if you're doing that, that's wrong. You need to go live in the world. You need to go live and be a light in the world. So he's reminding them of that. And so then he goes on from there and he says in verse 11, But I actually have written to you not to associate with any so-called 
Christian brother, if he is sexually immoral or greedy or an idolater, which means he's devoted to anything that takes the place of God, or is a reviler who insults or slanders or otherwise verbally abuses others, or is a drunkard or swindler, and he goes on to to make a list there, and he says, you should not even eat with those people. So what Paul is explaining to the church in Corinth is if you're judging people outside the church, there's something wrong with that. The judgment that I'm talking about is for you inside the church. See, you as Christians should hold each other accountable. Inside the church, we hold each other accountable. But how do we act outside the church? See, before the resurrection, the way that we acted to people outside the church is we judged and condemned them. But now, after the resurrection happens, and after the old covenant is put to death, and the new covenant comes to us, Jesus changes the whole thing. And Jesus changes He changes even Paul. So remember, Paul went from being the professional judger. And now look at what happens with Paul. I've got a a suspense building. Dun, dun, dun. We're building suspense here. Okay? Just in case you guys were asleep. But but I put this in here on purpose because it, it is such a contrast. It's so different. So the man that went out to murder Christians says in verse 12... For what business is it of mine to judge others? What business is it of mine to judge others? How does this guy go from judging people to death to then saying, it's not my business to judge anyone? So do you not judge those who are within the church to protect the church as the situation requires? And then in verse 13, Paul sets them straight. God alone sits in judgment on those who are outside the faith. God alone. See, Paul got it. Paul had one encounter with the resurrected Jesus. And when his eyes were opened, his heart was opened. And this man went from the old covenant to the new covenant. And now we can look at another guy named Peter. Peter is is one of Jesus' disciples. Peter hung out with Jesus. He was one of the twelve. He was on the inside. Peter had a very similar thing. See, Paul had his conversion five years after the resurrection. It wasn't like 20 or 30 years down the road. It was five. Five years after Jesus rose, Paul has an encounter. Now, five more years later, so Peter is 10 years after the resurrection of Jesus. Peter is hanging out on a rooftop, and he's, he's had some food, and he's smelling some food being cooked. And it's probably like a nice afternoon, a nice day. There's a bride going, and Peter decides to take a nap. And we would call this in my house a dad nap. It's like where you really just go into a deep sleep in the afternoon. And so in this nap, Peter has a dream. And in this dream, Peter sees all these animals coming down from heaven. And as all these animals are coming down from heaven, Peter sees that some of them are are okay, but the majority of them are unclean. And so as all these animals are coming down from heaven, all these things that are unclean, and what that means is that Peter was not allowed to eat them, because if he ate them, then it would make him unclean. And if he's unclean, then he could not have access to God and the temple. And Jesus says to Peter, Peter, eat it. Eat all of them. Eat anything. And Peter says, Lord, I can't do that. I've never done that. If I eat these things, I'll be unclean. And God challenges Peter and he says, how dare you call anything unclean that I have made? See, the old covenant, the 613 rules that kept Peter from having access to God was gone. And God was establishing a new covenant for Peter. And he was saying, everything that I've made is clean. Now, this would become a metaphor that would be so important because as soon as Peter wakes up from his dream, the second that he wakes up, there's a knock on his door. And who's there? It's it's a Roman centurion. It's a Gentile. It's a non-Jewish person. And Peter is being invited into the household of a Roman centurion because this Roman centurion wants to know the story of Jesus. And so Peter gets an opportunity to be invited to go and share the story of Jesus in this house. So Peter, he reluctantly, he goes. And he's walking up to the house. I like to really imagine this. And see, Peter, as a Jewish uh, person, he was not allowed to enter the home of a Gentile. And in fact, when Pilate invites Peter in earlier, 
Peter says, no, 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 we, we can't go in. When Pilate invites the other Jews in, as, as Jesus is on trial, they say, no, no, sorry, man. We can't actually cross the threshold in your house. And so here Peter's invited to the Roman centurion's house where the Gentiles are, and he comes up to the doorway. And I like to imagine this, this, this pause in Peter that says, everything in my life has told me that if I take this step, there's 613 reasons why I'm condemned. But Jesus has told me in one dream, in one message, that I can take that step. And when Jesus passes through that threshold, or when Peter passes through that, stre- that threshold, he steps out of the old covenant, and he steps into the new covenant. And he tells them about Jesus. And then Peter says this amazing thing to these, to these people. This is Peter realizing what the, what the new covenant is. And so in Acts, the verse will pop up here in Acts 34. Opening his mouth, Peter said, Most certainly I understand now that God is not one to show partiality to people as though the Gentiles were excluded from God's blessing. So Peter is saying, God doesn't exclude anyone. It's not just for the Jewish people. It's for everyone. No one is excluded. And he goes on to say, but in every single nation, the person who fears God and does what is right by seeking him is acceptable and welcome by him. See, something magic happened. Something holy happened. Something real and life-changing happened. When Peter stepped through that threshold, he took a step of faith. And he said, God, I trust the new covenant. And I'm going to leave the old covenant behind me. And when he did, and he tells the, 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 the people that had gathered in the Roman centurion's house, this amazing thing happens, and ten years later, after, after the Holy Spirit showed up in the upper room and just fell on the disciples like we talked about last week, ten years later, inside the house of a Roman centurion, the last place that it should happen, the Holy Spirit falls, and these people just get this incredible encounter with God. See, there's something amazing about the love of Jesus that we struggle to get. And, that, and that's why we have to ask ourselves, why is this important to me? And that's why, why I ask you, why is this important to you? See, when I think about what your actual takeaway is today, I, I, I think about, I, I go back to something I talked about last week, and I think about the empty chair. So if you look around in the room, we have some chairs that are empty. We've got a couple here and a couple spread out around. And you know, for me, when I see an empty chair, I see that there's a potential, that there's somebody out there that's living under a covenant of judgment. That there's somebody out there that's got 613 reasons rattling around in their head that's telling them that they are worthy to be condemned. And right here, I have an empty chair that has one reason because it only needs one reason that tells them that they are loved and they are accepted just the way that they are. See, it's not our job as a church. It's not my job as a pastor. It's not our job to judge anyone that's outside there. See, we are a church that believes that anyone can come just as the way that they are. Anyone, just any way that they are. In fact, we welcome it. We don't need perfect people coming in this building. We need imperfect people coming in this building because that's who Jesus came for. And the truth is, is that no one is perfect. So why is this important to you? What's your takeaway from this today? Your takeaway from this, from this today is that you can leave the old reasons why you feel condemned, why you feel guilty, why you're not enough, why, why you don't feel worthy. You can leave all those things behind and you can instead step into the freedom that Jesus doesn't condemn you. What would it be like for someone who's never had the opportunity to realize that Jesus does not condemn them to then accept and realize that that Jesus loves them and that there's no condemnation? And so to illustrate this point further before we end here, I just want to bring us back to that story in the beginning with Jesus and the adulterous woman. So here you have... Uh, here you have in the temple you've got this woman who's been brought in completely condemned and she's had people that have grabbed her and brought her into the center she's the center of attention 
Can anybody identify with that woman? Does anyone know anybody that can identify with that woman? Does anyone know anybody that lives in condemnation? Do you live in condemnation? And so that woman who lives in condemnation, who is being condemned, who knew that she was going to be put to death, she steps in the middle of the ring with Jesus. And now she has an encounter with Jesus where she leaves the old covenant and she steps into the new covenant. This thing that is the love, the freeing love that is no condemnation to you of Jesus. And what happens? Transformation happens. Now, let me show you what's so amazing about this transformation. And this gets me excited. Because no longer was it Jesus and the adulterous woman. Now, it was Jesus and the loved woman. See, all of her sin was, was not even judged. See, Jesus, it's not that Jesus took it all and threw it away. Jesus didn't judge it, period. He didn't look at it to judge it at all. So, I, I want this for my life. I want every day to wake up and know that all of my sin, all of my faults, everything that I should be condemned for, just gets completely erased by Jesus. And instead, I've got a Heavenly Father that stands up and looks at me. And He says, this is no longer you. Instead, you are just simply loved. And so, that's why this matters to me. And so the question that I would leave you with is which covenant are you under in your life? This is a message where I want you to reflect on this. I want you to take something away from this in reflection. Which covenant are you under? Now, I'll just let you in behind the scenes on my heart a little bit. And I know that we've got some new people here because of baby dedication and, and that sort of thing. And, uh, and then I'll pray and we'll get out of here. But just the behind the scenes on my heart is... I, I am absolutely emotionally, mentally, spiritually wrecked for those that don't know Jesus in this city. We have six million people that live in Cape Town. And we have 200 people in here. And I'm so thankful for the 200 that are in here every single Sunday. Listen, I go home every Sunday. I drive over the bridge, leaving Pinelands, and I think to myself, how on earth could I be so blessed and so fortunate to lead and be a part of this church with these people in it? I mean, I am beyond thankful, but I'm also beyond burdened because I at one point in time was a person that didn't know the love of Jesus. And so when I, when I look at you guys, I look at you with joy and with love, but I also look at you with an extreme burden. And I want you to catch that burden. And I hope that if you walk in here and there's any stress in your life or any depression or anxiety, if there's any doubt about who you are, I, I just want to bring God's word to you and hopefully it sinks in and saturates your mind and your thoughts and your heart and your takeaway from it is I can leave the old covenant. I can leave all that old condemnation stuff. And now I can pick up this new thing where Jesus looks at me and says, I do not condemn you. Go and be free. Wow. So my vision for this church is that everyone who comes in here gets hit with that and gets impacted with that. But then it goes beyond that. I'm not okay with just 200 people. Why? It's not about numbers. It's about souls. There's too many people out there that don't know Jesus and don't know how much Jesus loves them. You know, last weekend, just a personal story, we were in the emergency room on Friday night, and I told this story last Sunday, but we were in the emergency room because our little boy Wyatt was having some issues, and we had to take him twice in one night to the pediatric ward, to the emergency room. And as I was walking the hallways in the pediatric ward at Vincent Pilate, my heart just broke because I knew that Casey and I had a hope that we could lean on because we know how much Jesus loves us. And when I sent out prayer request messages, I knew that people were praying and I knew that those prayers came in the power of the name of Jesus. But as I walked up and down those hallways and listened to other kids cry and watched other families come and go, I just thought, how on earth can we be satisfied if there's one other person out there that doesn't know this? How on earth can we be satisfied if there's one more adulterous woman standing condemned in the middle of a group of people when all it takes is Jesus standing up and telling her, you're not condemned and there's no one here to condemn you. So that's my heart for you. 
That's my plea for you. And that's my heart and my plea for this entire city. So I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And I, I want you to think about that. I want you to think about what covenant it is that you live under. I hope this is something that you reflect on. Think about it every morning. Set aside two minutes in the morning when you wake up and think to yourself, today when I go out, am I going out condemned? Am I going out with 613 reasons why I'm condemned? Or am I going out with one reason why I'm free and I'm loved? So Lord, I just want to thank you so much.